Peace and blessings, everyone. Hello and welcome to this edition of Represent NYC here on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Uh, I'm today's special guest host, public advocate Jamani Williams. Uh, I've watched and been on Represent NYC in the past and I've always enjoyed it. So I'm excited to be here today on my first, my inaugural time as host. As your public advocate, one of my primary roles is to be the city's ombudsman and call out inconsistencies, inefficiencies, ineptitude, and inequity. Today, we'll talk about two issues that have been scrutinized and dissected and used in our city and our country uh, to both control and segregate. We're gonna talk about voting and public safety. We're gonna start out with voting. Our guest, our first guest is Susan Lerner, Executive Director of Common Cause New York, which is a respected organization in the fight for fair, equitable government and democracy. Anytime you hear those words, you generally hear Susan Lerner's name shortly thereafter. Susan, it's awesome to have you. Uh, thanks very much for having us, for being with us today. Jamani, you know I will always show up to talk about my favorite topic, which is voting. <laughs> Let's just jump out and, and, you know, I think people are, uh, were already concerned about voting. Uh, and then we had some issues with about 100,000 ballots uh, that went on incorrect. Uh, what should voters know about that? And well, why should they still have faith in the system? So first of all, what voters should know is that unfortunately accidents happen. Uh, I've read that there was a, a similar problem in another state. Um, and it's not a full 100,000 ballots that went out wrong. We don't know exactly how many number. We suspect it's a much smaller amount um, where there was a mismatch between the envelope that you put your absentee ballot in and sign what we call the oath envelope and the voter who received that absentee ballot package. So the good news is this happened in plenty of time to fix it. And it already is fixed for most of us. And the absentee ballot replacement packages have already gone out and most of us have received them. I think we all, I, I thought we all can agree the system largely works. Uh, we see people in high influential positions now, all the way up to the White House, purposefully putting doubt in the system. But then we see on the other side, people who are getting a little bit more jaded, even though uh, they don't want to put doubt for the same reason, uh, but they're still jaded on past experiences and things like this. Uh, how do we help the public just get past this and understand that their vote, once we can get it in, uh, will be as secure as it was before? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think it's by pointing to the many improvements that have been made by law, by executive order here in New York, and also in some of the improved procedures that the New York City Board of Elections has put in place since the June primary. This, our elections are a constant work in progress, as is our democracy. So all of us staying involved and uh, really coming out and voting and supporting our neighbors and friends voting as well, I think is the most important thing that we can do. But there have been changes to ensure that fewer absentee ballots are unfairly cast aside. There has been additional machinery that's been purchased by the New York City Board to speed up the process of sorting through, opening, copying, absentee ballot oath envelopes, a lot of things that have been done to really try and facilitate a smoother absentee ballot process. So I think that message needs to go out to voters. Um, the time it takes after the election to get every vote counted is time well spent. And we shouldn't be concerned that we don't have an instantaneous answer because if we had an instantaneous answer, it means ballots aren't being properly counted. Uh, that's, a, that's an awesome point. You may wanna just repeat that again, that we have to be prepared that on the night of election day, uh, we probably won't know who's the president of the United States of America. And we gotta make sure people are prepared for that. That's right. I mean, as a result of the pandemic, many, many more people are deciding <clears throat> that they wanna vote by mail. And here in New York, we've substantially expanded the ability of people to be able to vote absentee and not have to leave home uh, in order to cast their votes. As a result, that means there are a large number of absentee ballots, hopefully not very many affidavit ballots, but a lot of absentee ballots, and they have to be checked. They have to be cross-checked to be sure that an absentee ballot is not counted for somebody who voted in person. 
that the uh, absentee ballot signature matches the voter rolls and that it's an eligible voter. And if you have a million or even half a million absentee ballots in New York City, that's going to take time. Any rush job is sloppy and we don't want sloppy in our elections. Take the time, get every vote counted. Now that you mentioned, you, you brought up vote by mail and we're encouraging a lot of people to vote by mail. I think it's a very valid pathway to make sure your vote is counted. Um, there's a new state law uh, that is helping people vote, uh, vote by mail but, uh, easier. Our state is not as used to it as other states. There are some states that vote only by mail. So right. can you just help explain how it works? Has sure. it been successful in those states? Why should we have confidence in the vote yeah. by mail process now? There isn't time during the pandemic for New York to set up freestanding drop boxes for absentee ballots. But here we've made some really significant changes to make it make voting by mail more accessible to anybody who wants it. Your ballot comes to you in the mail. You then fill it out, filling in the ovals for the one candidate that you want for each race. You put it back in the oath envelope, you sign the oath envelope, you seal it, you put it in the return envelope, and then you have some choices. You can mail it back if you've got stamps, um, but if you don't want to mail it back, you can drop off your absentee ballot at any early voting or election day location anywhere in New York City. Or you can even take it even today to your local board of elections in whatever borough you're in. But if that is not what you want to do, you don't want to mail it, you don't want to drop it off yourself, you can ask a family member, a friend, a neighbor whom you trust to take your absentee ballot and drop it in a freestanding drop box in any early voting location, any election day location. This is a big change, it's a big expansion. It's designed to make it much easier for you to vote absentee if that's what you think is best for you in the middle of the pandemic. And in New York State, if you actually voted by mail and decided, hey, I actually wanna go in and vote for early voting on election day, what happens then? Well, New York is one of the few places where you can do that. Um, we always uh, prioritize voting in person if that's what the voter wants to do. So if you requested an absentee ballot, even if you got your absentee ballot, even if you mailed it back, you have an absolute right to vote in person. You go to your early voting location, you go to election day polling place, you will be able to vote. And the Board of Elections does a cross check, removes your absentee ballot, and does not count it. I think that's important because I know there's one person in particular in this country who keeps pushing uh, voter fraud, sure. even though in the years that we've been doing this, there has not been any ever any evidence of voter, a widespread voter fraud. I mean, we've seen things of uh, voter disenfranchisement. And I always want to separate that out from voter fraud, uh, which is why I say once your vote is in there, uh, it's pretty secure. So the objective is to get past everything. Uh, you know, it's going to be we expect some confusion during the pandemic, a high voter uh, turnout. But once you get your vote in there, it should be all right. And you can do that by mail or the days before October 24th to November 1st or on election day. You know, I said before, you know, why should people be, uh, feel like their vote will be as secure as, as before? But, you know, if we're honest, we've seen some voting problems in the past. Um, so um, that doesn't mean that the system would not be secure with your vote now, but we want to be honest with what people have experienced. So are we more or less prepared than we've been in recent years uh, for this type of election that's coming up now? You know, I'm really happy to report to everybody that there have been a real effort at the state and the local level to address some of the problems that we saw in the June primary. Frankly, it's the fastest I've ever seen these kind of improvements pushed through. So, we now have a system in New York State. If you accidentally um, don't sign your absentee ballot envelope, um, if you just send your absentee ballot back without the envelope, there's now a procedure where the Board of Elections has to notify you and give you a chance to fix the mistake so that your vote will still count. That is very significant. We had a race in Queens and people saw, you know, one vote doesn't count. A race, a few races have been won with very small votes, and the district attorney's race in Queens yeah. uh, was won by a uh, small amount of votes. And that issue of not having signed the ballot properly 
threw a lot of votes out. So now that they're, they're working and making it even more, uh, more likely that your vote will be counted, even if you made an error, giving you an opportunity to fix it. And that, I, you know, I don't want to gloss past that because that's, that's, that's actually incredible. It's, it's a really big change. And it's a change that happened by law. It's a change that was improved on further by a lawsuit brought by the legal women voters that they got the state to really improve the uh, cure process. So that's the first time, and that's new since June. And I think that's gonna make a very big difference. We redesigned the oath envelope so an, a human can actually read it and understand it and know that they have to sign it. Um, here in New York City, your oath envelope's likely to have a, a red X next to the space where you, the box where you need to sign it. So I think we're gonna see many fewer mistakes with absentee ballots and the mistakes that we see are gonna be cured. And you know, here in New York City, you can track your absentee ballot. That's new as well. Not only can you apply for it online, but you can go online and see where is it in the process. Oh, good, yes, they received my absentee ballot. Oh, hey, it got mailed two days ago. I should check soon in my mailbox to be sure it showed up. Oh, great, I mailed it back. Look, they got it. Um, these are all things that are designed to help people feel more secure, that they know where their ballot is in the process and that things are moving forward the way they should. And another big change, Jermani, is that in June, the Board of Elections was prohibited from mailing out absentee ballots any earlier than 30 days before the election. We did away with that requirement. That's why people were able to get their absentee ballots last month in time to correct any mistakes and in time for people to make their choices and get the ballot back with more than enough time to spare. That's awesome. And I'm getting the virtual uh, signals that we're, we're closing, we're running out of time. And I wanted to actually just ask you if you can uh, really quickly uh, just tell folks where they can get uh, more resources so they can get information about, uh, you know, uh, during the pandemic, if there's any, any issues with elections that we don't know about now, where they can find their uh, poll. And yep. after that, I'm going to jump. So I just want to thank you for joining us. Uh, we're urging everybody to uh, plan, make a plan to vote in the upcoming elections. Uh, voting early, as I mentioned, October 24th to November 1st. Not just the president. Down ballot is very important as well. Uh, exactly. So we want to make sure that people are out there. So just really quick, where can folks get some well, resources? Everybody should have received a mailing, if you're a registered voter, from the Board of Elections that has a lot of basic information. You can go to Vote NYC to, to look up your polling place, to verify that you're registered. And if you have problems or questions, you can always call the national hotline, 1-866-OUR-VOTE. And there are people who can help answer questions in Spanish, Asian languages, Arabic, as well as English. So you always have a resource with 1-866-R-VOTE, the national hotline. Thank you so much, Susan. Again, I appreciate this conversation. And I don't know everyone who's watching does. So peace and blessings to you, love and light. And we'll see you again. So thanks, thanks again, everybody. And we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're shifting the focus now to public safety an issue I've been uh, trying to tackle throughout my career as a public servant. Uh, one of the most glaring inequalities and inequities in New York City is around public safety. As we emerge from uh, the pandemic, we have an opportunity to make some change, to reimagine what public safety means and looks like in our city. Uh, we don't wanna just return to normal because normal didn't work for a lot of folks. We have uh, two awesome guests today, uh, Lieutenant Edmund Raymond, who I've had the pleasure of meeting and seeing his amazing work that he does in the NYPD uh, currently, and an activist who uh, called for reform and equity, Kay Bain, Executive Director of Community Capacity Development, CCD, a well-known organization focused on community development. It's just great to have both of you brothers here, and knowing Kay, as I know, uh, not too long ago, wouldn't be caught anywhere around uh, police, so it's, it's great to see him on here now. Used to be part of the problem, now very much part of the solution. Uh, so it's just awesome. Blessing to see both of y'all here. Thank you. Uh, let's get right to it. Uh, what does public safety mean to y'all? Is it the same thing for all of us, regardless of race, gender, nationality, religion? Uh, what does it mean and what is policing's role in public safety? Uh, we can just start with Kay. 
I love the question. So first and foremost, peace and blessings, Mr. Public Advocate. Always a pleasure. Um, this conversation, we feel like we've been having this conversation for some time. And starting, you know, looking at public safety, first word being public, it has to involve the community at large. And for too long, the conversation around public safety has not included those most impacted and affected by violence and some of the other public health issues that we face in our community. So we are also are looking at the reimagination of public safety and how do we meet these human needs that people are outraged about and, and screaming for in the streets and protesting peacefully most times and sometimes not so peacefully to get the attention of the state to notice that there's a personal responsibility and a shared accountability written into public safety. And as much as I respect and I hear the abolitionist movement that says, you know, totally dismantle and, and, and get rid of policing, I understand where that comes from. I know that police and law enforcement have a role to play in public safety. I know that they're an important part of keeping communities safe, but the priority has to be, has to be community-led initiatives around this issue. Lieutenant Raymond, what's your thoughts on it? Uh, first and foremost, uh, thanks for having me, and, and King, uh, Kate, thanks for joining, me, brother. That was a great point. Um, when I think of public safety, um, no, across the demographics, no one wants to be a victim of violence. Everyone wants to feel safe, but we have it's a, it's a more nuanced uh, response. We have to think of resources. You know, a lot of times, what leads to the, you know, the symptoms that we see. It comes from a lack of resources. So as Kay said, the police do have a role to play. Um, I don't, I'm not, you see, what, abolition is not something I'm completely against, but we can't put the cart before the horse. You know, it's chronologically certain things would have to be achieved before we could truly have a society with minimal police or less police. So, you know, we wanna have those things happen in the right order because let's be honest, we do have some issues in our community and if police weren't around, they'd be exacerbated. So overall, public safety is more, resor more resources and a role where police aren't overstepping uh, their boundaries and to the point that it gets discriminatory in nature. Now, Lieutenant, you, you've been a member of NYPD for a while, rising in the ranks, now without what some people call controversy. Um, you know, people should check out, um, you know, Crime and Punishment on Hulu, see you your journey in, in really whistleblowing things that were going on. Uh, you've been on patrols, you work leadership community, um, and there's still local and national leaders who deny the presence of systemic racism in the NYPD. Even though statistics prove them otherwise, even though we see on camera different neighborhoods being treated differently, show something else. Uh, how do we change the current system uh, to achieve uh, not just the adequate police reforms, because I don't know if uh, that's only thing we need, but to just even address the fact that there's systemic racism in probably every institution, uh, but also definitely in the NYPD. And I always keep in mind that no one person obviously has to be racist or a bigot to continue a system that's based uh, in those things. We just have to kind of admit so we can move forward. What are the biggest roadblocks to just getting that admission? Very, very important question, Jay. The conversation about around systemic racism and implicit bias, it actually has to start before policing. And you hinted to it by saying that it's, it's not just in policing. We have to have it start this conversation much earlier because people don't understand how systems work. People think white supremacy and systemic racism, well, white supremacy is someone with a hood screaming, you know, I hate all N-words. And it's so much deeper than that. And, and once people start to understand that the racism can be interwoven into the fabric and design and structure of a system leading to discriminatory results, then they'll open their minds. I, I've, been on, I've been in law enforcement for 12 years now. And I've, been, I've had these conversations with colleagues who didn't realize that their perspective was half-baked. Once I present this information to them, the information they were missing, sometimes they were still defensive going through that dissonance. But eventually when giving a thought, they realized, wow, I never saw it that way. I never considered that information or I never had access to that information. Uh, redlining is one of the things I speak about with colleagues a lot, explaining that the suburbs were created, not, not simply from, 
from meritocracy, but literally created by the government. Um, and, and as long as we have these conversations earlier, it's not going to sound completely outlandish when they hear it, when, it, when it's applied to law enforcement. So that, that's my thing. As a, as a nation, uh, implicit bias, critical race theory, which the, uh, the president just struck down, uh, these things have to be taught much earlier in our societies because policing exacerbates these these perspectives. But it does. People don't enter the police department, you know, with a clean slate, and then start to develop these thoughts once they're in. These thoughts are already there. That's important to understand how how interwoven all these things are, uh, and how we bring our experiences. All of us, as a matter of fact, have these implicit biases just by growing up in in on the planet. <laughs> Uh, Kate, you know, your organization is community-based. You've achieved some amazing results uh, around violence and gun violence in particular, uh, improving public safety for communities on the ground. What additional resources are needed to improve the work uh, that you're doing in cure violence or crisis management systems? Should violence and policing be the main focal points of public safety? Um, how do we get people to understand uh, that this is just as critical, if not more, uh, than what we're used to thinking about just call police and everything will be okay. So uh, to answer that first, I want to say I respect uh, Lieutenant the brother and his perspective, um, the fact that he understands the history and the contextualization that has led to some of the, as you pointed out, symptoms that we're, we're facing and you see the root causes. That's key and central to transformation. Um, with regard to some of the successes you mentioned, I, I just want to say we had some great mentorship. Our organization and many of the organizations doing this work are a product of the, some of the legislative and policy work that you did as a city council member when you uh, launched the Office uh, to Combat Gun Violence indirectly by the task force to, to prevent gun violence in New York City. When you went out and got resources to start what became the crisis management system, a lot of us inherited um, some of that energy, some of those resources. So we're a product of great mentorship and leadership in the work that we do. Something the brother said that, that really struck a nerve. So the work that we do is fundamentally human justice work. And human justice work comes from a framework and methodology that says human rights plus human development equals human justice. And that equation is very important to have awareness, to understand the context in which we're living and dying, to know that we spend $87 billion incarcerating people for decades and it hasn't had the effect that it was supposed to have, to know that there's a school to prison pipeline. Having the awareness and the education, right, is the first component. The second is resources, which we're saying here, or human development. So not only is it important that we, the resources are allocated, but the devil is in the details. How is it that these, these resources will be used to affect and impact those who have been systematically marginalized traditionally in this country? How, how does that happen? Um, because a lot of times on paper, I think it was Einstein said in theory, theory and practice are the same in practice, they're not. So sometimes there are things that look good on paper in terms of resources, but they're not getting into the hands of the people who are most directly impacted and affected. So we gotta look very closely at human development. Only when we look at the human rights po portion of this plus human development can we get to human justice. And we always have to start at human justice. When we start at criminal and criminal justice, we don't end up anywhere. So we have to start rehumanizing people and that goes for those of us on the ground, people like myself who have sued NYPD historically, who have been falsely and wrongly accused and arrested, um, like yourself as well, public advocate who's been in those situations, I know from personal experiences in your life, to humanizing law enforcement and police officers who are just also another component and caught up in this same system as the brother laid out earlier. Um, because when we look at suicide rates for law enforcement, when we look at alcohol abuse, Abuse. When we look at chemical misuse in law enforcement, we see very high numbers and percentages because I think the nature of an oppressive, oppressive system is that the oppressor and the oppressed both suffer in this. So again, that human justice equation is fundamental for if we want to see transformation and true change. We've lost the narrative uh, sometimes around, you know, this hashtag defund the police and people have uh, kind of misconstrued what it meant. Uh, I just want, you get both brought up abolishing the police, 
Uh, I, I just want to take a, a couple of minutes, just put your input in this defund versus abolishing, what it actually means versus what people are saying it means in terms of how we live in a world uh, where we're not just focused on policing as a response uh, to public safety while understanding that that is a part of it and law enforcement uh, also has a role. Absolutely. Um, when I hear defund, uh, what I hear is reallocate. And I, and I support it 100%. I can't tell you over the last 12 years the amount of times that I've responded to a 911 call. And when I'm there, I'm asking myself, what am I doing here? This is not a law enforcement uh, situation. You know, and I realize that uh, agencies need to be either created or existing agencies have to be strengthened um, and expanded to respond to certain things because there are things that are going to police that don't need to be police issues. Um, it's one of those things, until we get better at police practices and policy, if, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Many times I've responded to a situation that did not need law enforcement, but the law enforcement response is simply to you know, just arrest a person, et cetera. And it, again, we have to empower existing agencies or even create other agencies by reallocating some of the funds that go towards policing. And that's, that's my breakdown of defund, which is reallocate those funds. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I, I, well said. Um, I hear the same thing. I think it was probably poor branding and marketing because it doesn't encapsulate what needs to happen. I'm someone who believes in the connotation and vibration that words carry. So I would have liked to position it. If I was the, the innovator that came up with what has to happen, it would have been about redirection. It would have been something you know, about building up community. Um, but I understand the sentiment underlying it is that the people have the power. The people need to be empowered. I think, last point, police do get a bad rap. Every single call that comes in goes right to law enforcement from the minute, small to the large, you know, difficult things, the life and death situation. So to the brother's point in agreement, this is an opportunity for people to be empowered, for communities to take accountability. Um, so that's what I think the solution is in terms of defund the police. I appreciate that. And, you know, I think all, most of us who are on this work don't really have a problem with the hashtag defund the police. We have a problem with uh, how it's been misconstrued. And most of us understand it means real, reallocation and uh, redefining public safety. And uh, those are co goals that I think everybody can understand. And I appreciate the time that, that you've given us. This is an important conversation. I wish we had more time, but I hope like me, folks who've listened, have learned a little bit more, uh, thought a little deeper, and will decide to get involved in these issues and think deeper when you hear these things and don't just get caught up in the hashtag or caught up in a phrase or one thing you heard, because it's really important that we dig deep on these issues. So I want to thank our guests today, Susan Lerner, Kay Bain, and Lieutenant Evan Raymond. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure having this conversation with you all. Until next time, thank you for watching Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Peace. Mm -hmm.